I do think of myself at MIT still. I, I've managed to work with something like 10 MIT students after I left here, only one of whom I had met before I left here. I, it's, I still, it's in my blood. Um, before I came here, Freeman Gilbert said, oh, MIT, because he had studied here, and those of you who know Freeman know he is a brilliant man. He said, oh, Ted Madden is the best teacher I ever had. And, and I had a privilege that I think none of you ever had. I taught with Ted. In fact, I was a failure as a teacher, and the only class that really gives me pride is the class that he and I taught. And this was ideal. I taught the easy stuff, and then Ted would come in and teach the hard stuff. He'd make me look good, because teaching, teaching Magneto to Lyrics, as anyone who's ever studied it knows, is really hard. I mean, understanding it is hard. Then we'd go in the field. I'd spend three weeks in the field, camped in the desert. He'd come out. We'd do all the easy stuff. He'd come out. Then we'd go to Magne do Magneto to Lyrics. We'd come back here. We'd analyze the data. We were doing research. And Ted would be in charge of the hard stuff. He, he made me look good. It's the only, the only pride I have in my teaching was the class I taught with him several times. So this talk, um, Ted and Gene, if this is false, I apologize. Uh, Ted stood up 20-some years ago at a, at a meeting, a celebration honoring Bill, and said, and said, Gene Simmons said that rocks are stupid, but I think rocks are smart. <laughs> and, and I try to capture, as you would hear Ted say it there, Actually, I think Ted thinks that they're, they're gypsies. And, and I'm going to show you how I think that here, discussing seismology. Back when I came to MIT, I was a seismologist. Uh, I'm still trying to do a little bit. This is work that John Collins in Woods Hole and I have been doing for many years, looking at uh, seismic anisotropy under New Zealand. OK, the project originally started as a test, uh, as a contest between Brad Hager and his views and others of us wondering whether the, the uh, anisotropy in the upper mantle was in the lithosphere. So you have a crust overlying mantle lithosphere down here, over, overlying the sthenosphere. And is the anisotropy, which is a, the best strain gauge we have for getting at the mantle, at, at, oh, at the mantle because olivine is so ideal for this, is the, is the straining within the lithosphere, or does the fault that you see at the surface penetrate all the way through the lithosphere, and then really the anisotropy is due to strain in the asthenosphere? Well, PN, we're not going to ask that question today. PN travels in the uppermost mantle, below the moho, below the crust, where, we're not sure, but in the upper tens of kilometers in the mantle in here. And so the question here, because we're looking only in the upper part, isn't what's happening at greater depth, but just how wide is the zone of deformation underneath here? If the fault went straight through, there would be no anisotropy because there'd be no strain except on a localized zone. So insofar as there is anisotropy spread out, uh, uh, that's telling us there is strain at depth. And why New Zealand? First, plate no motion is known very well. I'll show you this. It's mostly strike slip. Strike slip is ideal for olivine because olivine crystals align along the zone of maximum extension, or along the axis of maximum extension, or when you have simple shear and enough strain, they align parallel to the, to the plane of shear and in the direction of shear. That's the fast orientation for P, or it's the fast polarization if an S wave is coming up perpendicular. So olivine is ideal for this. Strike slip environments are ideal. And we know, we know the total offset. We can do plate reconstructions. We can't do this well for the San Andreas fault or for most faults. Second, anisotropy is known to be large and clear and large. I'll show you uh, recent evidence of that in a, in a minute. So first, New Zealand is really a continental region. You think of these two islands, South Island and North Island, out in the middle of the Pacific. But if you plot the depths of the ocean, the blue and purple out in here is quite deep. This is all oceanic lithosphere all out in here, surrounding this area. But these areas, you have 20 to 25 kilometers of crust. It's a continental region. This, uh, Campbell Plateau, Chatham Rise, Lord Howe Rise going up in here. And getting, of course, shallower as you get near the coast. So New Zealand is the emerged part of a rather large continental region. So we're not looking at plate tectonics in the ocean. We're looking at continental deformation in New Zealand. Geologically, there's a big fault, the Alpine Fault, along here with 460 kilometers of displacement. But if you look, and, and a key offset, I should say, is Dun Mountain up here. Dun Mountain is, is ultramafic, ultramafic rock. It's where the name Dunite comes from, from Dun Mountain. That rock, you pick it up way down here, offset 
But notice that it's bent around down in here. There's strain in the crust, quite a large amount of strain. In fact, when you do this, redo this by reconstructing plates, so North Island, South Island down in here, reconstruct the North Island back at about 45 million years ago. Here's where the North Island would lie. You can see, uh, well, you can see the bending of this ophiolitic belt down in here. And the North Island, you can trace this up through the North Island. There's a, a famous magnetic anomaly, it's all buried in sediment, uh, the junction magnetic anomaly. Well, that region reconstructed would lie here. When you unbend this, you wind up with 850 kilometers of displacement, but roughly half of it, 460 strike slip at the surface, the other half strained. So the crust is being strained. Presumably the mantle underneath is also being strained in some way, making it this ideal place to work. OK, I'm going to show you an animation made by Steve Candy. Australia lies here. There's New Zealand, Australia. This is going back in time. We're looking now at the present, zero million years ago. Australia will move in, nestle up against here. New Zealand will unwrap itself with slip on the Alpine Fault, backslip. And then they'll both close back in against um, Antarctica and Australia. So now I have to do this without uh, screwing up. And here's my challenge. Uh, yeah. Uh, come on. What did I do? I didn't do it. Oh, maybe I have to get over here. Sorry. Oh, no. You want help? Um, not, I, pretty soon I'm going to need help. Let's see what happens if I just push a button. Oh, nope, that went the wrong way. Yeah, I don't know that I can hit it. Oh, uh, there. Ah! Yeah, why don't you do it? You hit the little triangle. So as I said, you, I told you what you're going to see. Yes, it's a... Sm no, 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 just do it this way. It'll work. You're not quite on the triangle. <laughs> Oh, no, let's just skip it. We don't, okay. uh, we don't need to do it. I've told you what it'll do. Uh, you, and I've already leap, leapt to the, to the reconstruction, so but I'm going to try it one last time here. It should just by... Oh, well, maybe it's not connected up. Okay, so I told you what it was, and I showed you the reconstruction earlier. OK, so this is now shear wave splitting, map of shear wave splitting up in here. You see the southern end of the, um, south of the North Island, the South Island. Shear, waves, a shear wave comes in. It splits into two quasi S waves. The faster of them is polarized parallel to the maximum of elongation of the olivine crystals. Two seconds is the time between the first arriving quasi S wave and the orthogonal one coming in later. Two seconds is a large time. The world record on this is a little more than two seconds. These tend to align parallel to the shear zone. If you have a shear zone, the Alpine Fault goes through here, big splitting parallel to it. It's, it's consistent with what we would expect if you've sheared a layer substantially thick to get a, a, a time between the faster and the slower one of about two seconds. As you go away from the island, as you go further out, Notice that the orientation rotates around, becomes different. Uh, the, uh, the orientation here is parallel to the what's called absolute plate motion. It's the relative motion of the Pacific plate down here relative to a hotspot frame or some frame that's defined for absolute. If you go off the northwest coast, again, you're parallel, parallel to plate motion given by that arrow. And as you go further and further away, they rotate. And then they get small out in here. This is oceanic lithosphere. They're more north-south. Again, parallel to absolute plate motion. So some of this anisotropy seems to be in the asthenosphere underneath, dragged by the plates. But the main part is along, along the, the Alpine Fault itself and parallel to the sense of shear. OK, uh, truth in advertising. All of these are data. Each one is a point. In each case, what we've done is taken arrival times at two stations where the back azimuths differ by only three degrees. So in fact, we're using only a tiny subset of all of the data. This allows us, though, because we're using the same earthquake along essentially the same path to the first station, uh, we, errors in locations, errors in, in uh, origin times, they're gone. We don't have to worry about them. Of course, everything is station correction, cor is corrected for station delays. And you see there's a huge scatter. 
this has the, been the nightmare of this whole study. We don't understand the scatter. But if you average all these, the error bars get quite small when you have tons of data, and you see a signal that looks like what you'd expect for anisotropy. This is the whole region, all the whole area off the coast, not just near the coast. OK, a couple of seismograms. The red up here is across the island, almost perpendicular, an earthquake out here, a rare event actually, recorded at the closer station, RPZ, and the more distant station, New Zealand 11. So these are, the red lines show our, our picks for when the P wave arrived here at this station and at this station with a relatively low speed. So if you want this speed to be higher, if you say this is too low, you either have to say pick that one later, I don't think any of you would do that, or you have to pick this one earlier. Maybe you'd do that. Maybe you'd say the P wave is earlier here. This is the quality of data we, we have to work with. The green one is more oblique, pretty clear P wave at the nearer station. You might pick that later, but probably not, probably not because of the change in frequency. That would be the likely pick, although you might say, well, we can pick it earlier, which would give you a higher speed because the more distant station would arrive earlier than we picked. The blue one, path along the island, nearly along the island, high speed, this is an outrageously high speed, 9.3 kilometers per second. You can do nothing to olivine to make it give you that kind of a high speed, except maybe put it under core mantle boundary pressures and, and not allow it to undergo a phase transformation. Anyway, P wave, the closer station is picked here. The more distant station is picked there. If you want to make the travel time longer to make this a lower speed, you'd have to pick that later. I don't think any of you would do that. Or you have to pick this earlier. Well, that's maybe you would. Anyway, this is our problem. We have this enormous scatter, and we don't know how to get out of it. If we break this up into regions, the top up in here shows this red box in here, only data within that red box. We don't have much going across. So with, this is now a plot of apparent speed corrected for uh, station delays versus back azimuth on this axis. So we don't have much in the way of back azimuths at 150 degrees because we don't have earthquakes out here. Again, you can see big scatter, which we can't get rid of, but still you see a, a tendency for, for a change in the, in the apparent speed as you change the orientation over in here with a rather large amplitude if you fit this. And this is, this is not small. This is many, many percent in this particular case. Uh, okay, how good is it? Well. This is for the region to the southeast of New Zealand out in here, a much smaller amplitude, apparent amplitude in the anisotropy. Again, with a large scatter, we can't do anything about it. And off the west coast up in here, a box way up in here, again, the same pattern. So the picture I'm trying to give you is we have P wave anisotropy in here. The orientation, the maximum speed is approximately north 50 or 60 uh, east, oriented this way, or its mirror image, 200 and north 50, 60, 230, 240 degrees, back the other way, of course, it's an orientation. What we would expect if we had sheared this region. So if we take, break this into a bunch of boxes, you might call this poor man's tomography, but I would argue you have to do this before you would risk doing tomography at all. What you find is, is the boxes that are overlapping in the islands give you quite large anisotropy of order 8%. And the orientation, north 60 east, is what you'd expect if you were shearing this zone in here. As you go further, if you go to the southeast, the magnitude of anisotropy decreases, but also the orientation decreases. So uh, it, these stations are nearly north-south. They're not very different from, from the SKS. If you go to the northwest, up in here, the orientations are, again, still the same as they are on the island. But again, you drop down. So the width of the zone of maximum um, and isotropy and hence maximum shear is only, only 100 or 200 kilometers wide. It's, very, it's a very narrow zone, not too different from what the SKS showed you. Now, in the context of how would you get this from deformation, if you have a thin viscous sheet, elegant theory by England, Hausman, and Sonder would say, well, if you allow your rock to obey a nonlinear viscosity relationship, strain rate varying as a power of strain, uh, so Right, let's start that again. Strain rate varying as stress raised to a power, this should be deviatoric stress, I used the wrong symbol, uh, to some power n where this is of order three, usually for olivine. If you have that style of deformation, you predict the strain rate to decay away from a boundary exponentially, and the decay constant, this lambda, will depend on the length of the boundary. This would be the length of the boundary parallel to the alpine fault, 
northeast southwest trending boundary divided by 2 pi and divided by the square root of, of n that goes into that relationship. And if you say that n is 3 and the width is 500,000 kilometers long, you predict a width that's 550 to 100 kilometers wide, similar to what we observed. So we would say that the deformation of, the, of lithosphere New Zealand with that value, approximate value of lambda inferred from Pn, passes the test that you're deforming the lithosphere in a simple way in, in this respect. Well, um, Ted, um, I, I, I want to give you my impression of Ted's view of things, and, and I've, I've borrowed from an eminent poet here. So this is advice from Ted. Rocks, like wayward, wayward girls, will still be coy. To those who woo them with two slavish knees, you can't imagine Ted ever. <laughs> but make surrender to a thoughtless boy, and dote the more upon a heart at ease. Now there's Ted. They are gypsies. Will not speak to those who have not learnt to be content without them. Ye lovesick bards, repay them scorn for scorn. You geoelectric nards, lovelorn madman that you are, make your best bow to them and bid adieu. And then if they like them, they will follow you. And I contend that Ted, he always he showed respect to all of us. He never disrespected anybody. He didn't even disrespect rocks. He paid them their due and was the gem of a guy that uh, we all remember. Thank you. <laughs> I think we're definitely closer. Um, I think 30 years ago, earthquake prediction looked pretty discouraging. And what I've watched, I, I worked on this and quit because I couldn't see anything smart to do. And I look, I look in the last 10 years at what's been learned about earthquakes, what's been learned about how strain uh, actually is released slowly over time in the subduction zones, and how we understand why we see it in some places where we don't it has been enormous. So I don't, I, I, I remember watching a, a film where someone says, I predict in five years we'll predict earthquakes. Well, I'm, I'm not going there. <laughs> but, but I do, I can imagine in 30 years we will, we'll be there. 30 years, I doubt it last Ted by quite a bit. So that's, I'm pretty safe making that. <laughs> but I do. Th I think that what we've seen after a long 20-year lull is a lot of progress in the last 10 years. By the way, I wanted to tell you, I also played ice hockey with Ted, and and, and it was it was quite an experience because all the rest of us thought we were playing basketball. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, thank you.